also want to thank you for your patience. I know it was a little late getting started. And before we begin, um, we do have translation, and this event will be Ukrainian and English. So if you need translation, make sure you have the headsets. And uh, maybe Tanya, you can say in Ukrainian. If you want to use the please find a pair of earphones. I see that almost everyone has one. Yes, if you don't have enough, please give us one. Thank you, Tanya. So as not to waste any more time this afternoon, I would like to introduce the host of our event, uh, the host of our talk show style. Uh, today we have Volodymyr Solokhub. He's a correspondent for Ukraine today. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Volodymyr. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Many thanks for inviting me. Many thanks for introducing me. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real pleasure to, to be here. And uh, I know that you're all here to, for, for one and only reason. You're here to meet and greet Oksana Masters. But uh, before we, we invite Oksana and before you have a chance to see her in the flash, um, there is a story I would like to share with you about Oksana. Uh, we were talking to her several times, and um, I was always asking, what do you remember from your times in Ukraine? And um, there's a story she shared with me. You know that she's been living in Ukraine until she was seven in an orphanage. And when she was in an orphanage, there was it was a, a prize for her. She would be given the sugar cubes for washing other children's socks. So for a five-year-old orphan with disability to get a rare treatment, a sugar cube, she would get up in the middle of the night and wash other children's socks. So when she came with her mother to the US, her mother had to hide the, the, the boxes with, with sugar cubes from her because this was the only idea for her of, of a treatment. This was the only idea of her of something sweet and something which she wanted to get. Remember this story. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to welcome to give a round of applause to Ukrainian-born American Paralympic champion Oksana Masters. We would like to do this as, um, as uh, interactive as possible. We would like to involve the, the audience in, in our discussion. We would like to, to, for you to, to ask the questions, uh, to, to, to give your comments, to give your thoughts. Um, I will start with, with asking some of the questions and uh, you're um, welcome at any point to, to step in and, and talk to Oksana directly. So, um, Oksana, let's, let's begin with with, with a question about, about your, your childhood, about, um, uh, about your early days. Because um, you, you were born with um, several radiation uh, birth, in fact, d d d diseases, infused diseases. And until the age of seven, you, you were living in an orphanage until your mother adopted you and brought you to, to, to the US. And right now, it's your first time when you're visiting Ukraine since that time. How do you feel about that? Um, I feel in shock. It's, it's I think, now starting to hit me where I am. Um, I feel so lucky to be able to have the opportunity to come back home with such good memories and think, and to know, too, that, you know, um, that everything, this is my home, where, who shaped me as a person. It started the molding process of who I am today. But obviously, for you as a seven-year-old child, when you were taken from the orphanage, uh, 
when you were taken into a loving family, into, to, to, into a loving uh, environment with, with your mother caring for you, with your mother trying to give you all the love which you were, which you were deprived. It must have been a quite a great shock for you. Tell, do you remember those, those feelings when you finally realized that you have a real family, that you have a real home, and moreover, you moved to a completely different country? Um, I, I was so shocked and excited, you know, I, th that has been my dream as a kid since I was, seven, uh, until I was seven and a half years old, and, um, I, I don't know if I instantly, like, loved or anything, but I know I was so excited and so happy to get a mom, and, you know, one thing I got with my mom was like instant connection. I instantly felt safe. This was my mom. I know that, um, you know, that she, that's my mom. It just so happened that she was halfway across the world instead of, you know, closer. Um, and I, I remember being afraid to fly over the ocean to go to my new home, but I wasn't afraid to fly just to go over the ocean part <laughs> for some reason. Um, and it, it's just an indescribable feeling. Well, actually, your mother, when we were talking to her, she uh -oh. said that, uh, well, first of all, it took her two and a half years yeah. to go through the adoption process, to go through all the procedures, all the hurdles, to, to prepare all the documents. And, but then when I was asking you, why, when I was asking your mother, why did you decide to adopt Oksana? Why Oksana? And she said a very, very amazing thing, something which, which you were saying right now. She said that when she saw your picture, she <laughs> knew you were her daughter. You were supposed to be her daughter. Yeah, that's pretty crazy because, you know, she, I know, well, now I know, she wanted a baby at that point. And so it's, uh, you know, it's one of those things that just proves there are some things that just, you know, can't be put in words, but it's feelings, and you listen to those gut feelings, and you know, and she looked in my eyes, I'm so happy that she was so brave to follow that gut instinct. So, Oksana, can you tell us a little bit about your early days in, in the U.S., um, about how you got adopted? Your mother said that uh, you learned English pretty, pretty fast, three weeks, right? Well, yeah, yeah, I don't three weeks. Maybe, maybe like six, eight weeks to get fully. Um, yeah, but she said like in three weeks you're already talking to children. Yeah, you were talking to, to other children in English. Well, she's a speech pathologist, so. <laughs> she helped. She helped a lot. I got a lot of corrections. <laughs> so, um, tell us about sports. What motivated you to, to take up sports when, when you moved to the U.S.? Um... You know, I don't think when I moved to the U.S., I knew I wanted to uh, do a sport, a specific sport. It was something that, um, I was always an active child. Uh, my mom called me a spider monkey because I would climb up the steps and try to jump off as many steps as I can. You were also climbing the trees, right? Yeah, I love trees. <laughs> um, there, there's a pattern here. Um, I love climbing trees. I, you still look at the trees with a special look, right? What? You still look at the trees with a Oh my gosh, yeah. And you know what? There's really great climbing trees here, I've noticed too, so it's really cool. So, again, going back to sports. Yeah. Um, how, how did it happen? Okay, you were active child. So, yeah, I was active. Um, I always liked doing things with my body and moving around. And, um, um, and then when I got introduced to rowing when I was 13, um, I... It was one of those things when I, I got on the water, and it was in one of those undescribable feelings. It was instant. And, you know, th like re re uh, being here, I had a lot of time to kind of maybe think a little bit more of why I liked sports so much. And it's because I think, you know, coming from the background I came from, um, and that I wasn't able to express with my words, and so I internalized a lot of things and just kept it in. And um, sports was something that I would be able to let my feelings out through, through, emotion, through emotions and through physical action in a positive way rather than um, speaking about it. And if I wasn't ready to say or wanted to express anything, I could just 
let it out on the water in the boat and then leave and then go shopping or something. Yeah, talking about shopping, I yeah. think this is... <laughs> I'm this a girl. is yeah. This is something which 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 are have quite a specialty, yeah. right? Yes, yes. It's a it's a curse that I am addicted to shopping. I guess your mother must have had a lot of hard times with you in that respect. Yeah. So like one of the things, not about shopping, but um, she gave me an outfit to wear, and apparently I don't I don't remember this, but this is a memory she told me um, when we were still in Ukraine. She gave she picked up my outfit. And I was like, I walked back there and took apart her outfit and put back my own outfit together. <laughs> so, how do you travel with, uh, how many bags do you carry with you, suitcases? Too many. Oh my god, too many. But, because I, I basically bring everything but the kitchen sink with me when I travel. <laughs> I bring my own coffee, I bring my own hot pot, I bring... Even though I know we're not gonna go out out to a nice dinner, I bring nice clothes. I don't know why. Um, and then, truthfully, I end up wearing like five of the things I brought when you're training. All right. So going back to to to, to the sports, your sports career, it's it's quite quite um, impressive. Um, I understand you took up sports. Correct me if I'm wrong. Somewhere in two thousand two, mm -hmm. it was must have been rowing. Mm -hmm. And then, in ten years. You became the first American Olympic champion in adaptive rowing in your London Paralympics. How 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 hard for you was to, to train and to prepare? You know, I, I, it really wasn't hard for me um, because the way I started rowing was through it was my passion. I loved it, and like I said, it was a way to express myself without being heard, but just let my own emotions kind of and feelings get out of my body and um, so for the first eight years of rowing I did it because I loved it no one pushed me into it I wanted to go and I learned about it and then I just decided to you know push it farther take that extra step and get competitive with it and see you know I'm gonna see how good I am who can if I can beat anybody and um, the opportunity came to try to um, Train for the Paralympics. I had no idea what the Paralympics was at first, but um, what that meant was also when you want to transition from just a recreational fun training to an intense, serious athlete, that sometimes means moving out of your comfort zone um, and moving away from home. And it's really hard because you, I had to leave again my, my safe place and not knowing what to expect and to even if it was gonna work out rowing, um, if we would end up being good or not. And obviously to become a professional Paralympian, to become a professional sports professional, sorry for <laughs> too many professions. No, um, I like it, that's cool. <laughs> elite professional, Ooh, sports yeah, professional. Yeah. So you had to sacrifice quite, quite a lot in yeah. particular, I would assume your social life. I would assume, and you also had to drop out of college. You, yeah, you know... Um, was it worth it? Oh my god, yes. You know... <laughs> yes, it was. It was, at times, it was like, you know, I swear I'm coming back home, this is not worth it, I'm done, I'm done. But you know, I also hate, I don't want to have that little voice in the back of my head saying, what could have happened if you stayed? And you know, a lot of times I told my mom that I'm coming back, and then she would remind me and support me, like why I'm doing this. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't want it, and you're not happy, then come home. But you know, don't come home just because you're not happy. You know, find ways to get comfortable there, make new friends where you are training. Um, and um, yeah, and I did. I lost, um, not lost, but I had to move away from my friends. Um, I. You know, sometimes I didn't go to some school dance type things because I, w I would rather pursue this. And college-wise, I, I went to school, I started college, and then I realized, you know, in order for me to get really serious, I need to commit 100% to something. And um, I decided that sports is something that isn't always going to be there for me. I, um, 
as an elite athlete, an Olympic athlete, you know, you push your body to your limit. And then as a Paralympic athlete, you push it even more than, than just your, um, just an, an Olympian. Because you have to, you know, whether in your wheelchair, you have to go up the steep hill to get into your home sometimes or get your wheelchair in and out of your car. And that's just a continuous workout that, you know, Olympians don't get or <laughs> work with. So I understand you brought with you some of the pictures from from your training, from from yeah. your sports, which we would kindly ask now to 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 show. And they're gonna on be mixed in with us. some. They're gonna be mixed in with some like pictures of just growing up and just me. And I think I think I think everybody here would be more than happy to see these pictures. And yeah, uh, sure. while we're waiting Ooh. for these pictures. Yeah. While we are waiting for these pictures, tell us because apart from 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 the summer sports like adaptive rowing, you also do cross country skiing. Um, yeah. So how how did it happen that you you were doing both summer and winter Olympics? Uh, accidentally. <laughs> um, I think we already have some pictures. So also, this is yeah. Let us. We can move a little bit like this. Okay. So we can first of all we can open the screen. Oh, you can see. <laughs> so you can you can both see uh, what's on the screen and. Uh, that is, um, so this is actually not a sport I do. So it's not only cross country skiing <laughs> but also snowboarding. I am a thrill junkie. I love to uh, you know I love dangerous things. I get it. I love the feeling of it. It sounds really not smart, but. Well, at least you're wearing like, wearing a helmet. <laughs> yes. Um, so. This is my first day snowboarding, and what I actually did was... Um, you decided to take two boards at the same time. Yeah, you know, one wasn't enough, I'll bring it back up. Um, I, I took off my knee from right here uh, with this tool, and my socket, basically, my I had um, my prosthetist who makes my legs for me. He, this was, I was a little beta little hamster thing to practice making a snowboard thing. He also tuned you to the board, to the snowboard. Yes, so he, I was basically locked in and screwed in into the board. Um, and then the way I, I snowboarded was just moving my body and your shoulders, which is just like snowboarding. Um, so yeah, that's me trying to act all tough because I can snowboard. <laughs> well, and here I guess uh, are your pictures for for so, right after rowing. Yeah, this is from London, and this is the um, I think this is the, the a, a heat. So in rowing, we had to do we had two heats, and then if you didn't win your heat, you had to race another race called the reps, um, because they go in each heat two go to the final, um, a final, and then. Two from the reps go to the final as well, and. Um, Oksana, can you tell a bit about your partner? Because uh, your partner in adaptive rowing is a yeah. military veteran, right? Yeah, this wouldn't be here. This, I wouldn't be able to say, you know, I have a medal from London without Rob Jones, who is my partner. He is. Um, he's a military veteran too. He was a marine for the U.S. military. <coughs> He was, um, his job was to basically find the landmine and the hidden bombs and stuff in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so he was out looking and uh, stepped over one that was, um, that was hidden deep down and he lost both of his legs, were, he lost both of his legs above the knee. So he's just like me basically. Um, but you know, a lot, I learned a lot from him because he never once felt sorry, he never once was like, my life is over or anything. Um, he loved working out and that was his passion. He liked the challenge. This um, is, do you guys know who I am in this one? Include. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> um, this, I think I was maybe 18 and this is uh, high school prom. So um, these are just some of the friends that now I see horrible dress choices I made. And that's we were back to to Lana Olympics, and that's you were your partner, right? This is the yes. This is Rob and I with the Brazilian team, and in Beijing, that Brazilian team won the I think a bronze or a silver medal in Beijing at the Paralympics, and then the Russian team 
Um, and this race is actually the race that we had to qualify the boat for London in order to compete. And um, basically there were like 16 teams there and only two went on to get to be in the top two and that was the race we won. And here we have a nice close up. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is just, um, I was in the rowing is backwards. So really what you think is the front is really the back and vice versa. So you're going that way. So I was in charge. I, I, I told him where we go and I moved him. <laughs> this is what I like to think. Um, this, is, this is my mom and I at a Christmas in a family, or with my family, <coughs> maybe three years ago now, I'm not sure, something like that. Um, they, my family, I guess, traveled somewhere and got these hats, and they were going around to make everybody take a picture with those hats. <laughs> uh, this is the earth, and this is um, how I train for rowing when we're not on the water. It's really painful, so if you like it, I think that people are doing it wrong because should, you should not like something <laughs> like that. Um, this, is, can you guys, do you know where I am on this one? Okay, we'll ask the audience. Oh, by the way, Oksana brought some uh, uh, presents with her. Yeah, I brought um, for I don't... the most active participants of our talk show. <laughs> so I, I encourage you to try and guess here where Oksana is. Pasirini. In the middle. Yeah. Pasirini. In the middle. Um, yeah, my little orange thing is keeps my legs warm. Um, and this is in Colorado, and this is just uh, a race for actually able-bodied race skiers. And we were an exhibition, and uh, we were kind of, ever, after everyone started, we got to start behind them and race on their course and prepare for Sochi. Uh, biathlon is a sport I do. I am Among other sports. <laughs> okay, I should first phrase that. Biathlon is a sport I'm trying to do. Um, so the way it works in biathlon is for every shot you miss, you have to do an extra penalty loop. And the penalty loop and I have become really well, no, we know each other very well. I spend a lot of time in there because I cannot shoot yet. Um, this is right after Sochi with a silver medal that was an extreme shot. This my mom. And my coach, we're just picking his mouth. This is cycling, uh, and this is how a hand cycle looks like. I take my legs off and kind of go inside there, and I push. I guess my you body. just can't stop at one sport. You have to do all of them. <laughs> and, and and by the way, uh, Oksana is uh, preparing for the Rio Games for the sport, right? Hopefully, I yeah, I'm not leaving myself a lot of time, but. Have you have you qualified already? Um, you know, it's hard to say officially because the U.S. team, regardless of um, if, you know, if you have a strong chance of meddling, you have to go through the U.S. nationals and, um, and, then, the, and then the U.S. national Paralympic qualifier. And so two months before Rio, everybody will have to compete for a slot for USA. And it's you make a time and you hit your standard. You're you're going. If not, then wait four more years. <laughs> or two years, as in your case, because the winter two Olympics. Years because yeah, you whip out <laughs> your skis. You were doing both summer and winter. <laughs> yeah, you just whip out your skis and start skiing. Um, this was um, I must have been maybe 10, 11 around this picture. Um. Do you guys know which leg is fake and which one's real? I gotta see now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yep. So the left one is a prosthetic leg. Uh, as a kid, I was actually I was actually really self-conscious of, of my prosthetic. Um, and I, so I tried to cover it up with foam to make it look as real as possible. Um, and, then, and then I realized it actually made it look even weirder. <laughs> so, um, but this is, yeah, that was like a, kind of like a, not a class, but a different group of prosthetists were there and um, were kind of teaching you how to use the legs and stuff. 
And that's embarrassing so picture. We're back to this picture. You're done with this? Yeah. Okay, let's go see. Um, this was the Sochi Games, and this was the 5th, 12th kilometer. This was actually probably my best memory of the games, but not because of the medal. It's because I, um, of where I was, I was up, of who, where I was and who I was on the stage, on the podium with. I know, you know, Ukraine means so much to me, it's my home. Mm -hmm. So, to have, you know, you, with Milip of like, oh, I admire her, I like her, she's a sweet person, and, um, and I was behind the stage shaking because I was next to Ludmilla Pavlenko, who won the gold medal for her country, which is my country, which was my birth home. And I was next to her. And um, it was just, and then I was next to her with second place behind, you know, where it was hosted, in the country that it was hosted. And um, that, that was my best memory. Of, of my experience of the 2014 games. Uh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> I look like a little boy. But um, so when I got home, my. I think it's the shirt. <laughs> yeah, that's not doing me any justice, and neither is the hair. <laughs> um, is it still, still in Ukraine, in the orphanage? No, this is at home at my mom's house in New York. And this is my first uh, few months of being home and she had painted kind of like a ruler of like a growth chart to mark each week or month or year of uh, how tall I'm getting. And so she marked there around like 42 inches tall and that was after a few months of being home already. So, but your, I, mom, your mom said that you started growing quite quickly once you moved to the U.S. I did. I grew, what, it, what it, it was like eight inches in the first month of I think we need home. the help from the mom. <laughs> eight inches in six months. All right. Six months. <laughs> okay, that'd be a miracle. <laughs> so and now eight. we need a converter to convert <laughs> inches into centimeters. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. So eight inches, how much is that? Funny. Huh? 20. 20 centimeters. A bit more. So it's 20 centimeters in six months. Whoa. I feel like I wish my hair could grow like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, this was before both of my legs were amputated. Um, my, I, 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 I skating, obviously. Um, the far picks of my farther leg away that's tan colored, yellow colored. Um, it's a prosthetic that basically my leg went into and sat on because my leg was around four inches shorter than my right one was. And so it evened me out. Um, it kind of, to me, to, if you guys are wondering what it feels like, it's kind of um, getting <laughs> like a cinder block but on, and just balancing on stilts. <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like to walk on prosthetics. Oh, ah, so down. this one you guys are doing it for. <laughs> this was, I think this was actually one, the second day after meeting my mom. It was the second day she came to the orphanage, and this is in my orphanage. Um, and that's me looking at this baby doll, because somebody told her that's the word I knew how to say in, in English. Um, and that was the only word I knew how to say in English at that time. I had no clue what a baby doll was. That's why I'm looking at this thing like, okay, what do I do with you? <laughs> uh, these basically were the seven kids that were. That was your gang. No, we were the we were the mafia. We were the crew. <laughs> yeah, we ran the place. Um, and my two best friends was Vova, who's the, the farther one in the dark. Clothes and then I don't know why, but we call them Zayats. I don't know why. Um, and he's kneeling next to me, and that's my this ma mixed matched clothes that I wore. Well, but Vinny the Pooh is Vinita, nice. Yeah, and, you, you, you also said there is this interesting story that a girl from your orphanage 
who was also adopted by uh, by, by, the, by the people in the in America. In Colorado. In Col she contacted you in via Facebook recently, or when it went. Tell, tell, tell us the story. Yeah, well, Facebook is first of all, uh, it will get you connected with everybody, even people you went to middle school and elementary school, and post pictures that you never wanted to be seen again. <laughs> so, like, um, it was, it's, it's an amazing tool. It, you know, my, this was an orphanage, I think it was a baby home, actually. It was the orphanage before I moved to this orphanage. And her name's Julia. I don't know if I'm saying it right, I'm so sorry. But she reached out to me and was like, hey, are you Oksana Masters? I think we were in the orphanage together. I was adopted by so-and-so and live here. And I was like, what? <laughs> and then she, she sends me a picture and I'm like, oh my god, that is me and her dancing. <laughs> it was so weird, so yeah. And this is uh, my first prostitute in America. Um, this is my first few months in America, and I was um, just getting fitted for this kind of device that helped me even out my leg so I could walk even without hurting my body. And then I had a brace to kind of stabilize my other leg because it was severely deformed as well. That's me at the beach. <laughs> um, I this was my first experience at the beach and I think I look happy here. I think I'm loving it. Um, I buried myself in the sand and thought it'd be really fun to dig around and it was so soft and you know I think it was just uh, an incredible feeling. Um, I I hate the feeling of sand on my body now though. <laughs> but trees. I like to climb trees. <laughs> Yeah, so and that, those are just a few pictures of um, a kind of things I did growing up. So I think we can now take some questions from, from the audience. Um, you're welcome to, to ask. Yeah. Uh, does your mother accompany you during your competition? Can, can you please speak in the mic for the interpreter? Yeah. Does your mother accompany you when you take part in the competitions, because I see that you are very committed to your family, and I am an athlete too of Ukrainian Olympic team. And my when my husband supports me during competitions, it's very encouraging. So, what about you? Um, she does, but um, when I first started competing, I was I didn't want her there. Um, I think because I don't know, I was younger, and I think I didn't want her to see me fail either. I didn't know what to expect, and I think one of the first things she really, that was a big race that she came to watch was London Paralympic Games, and um, from then on out, she has made a point to come, and I have yeah, asked her and want her to be there um, for every race, and it, it's so, it is so encouraging, because even though I might not get to, you know, be in the same hotel room with her, knowing that she's in that country with me, um, and she's just a phone call away or a message or email away. Um, I, I have my home with me, and because she's my home, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you do anything uh, to help? Do you do anything to help uh, the disabled in America to uh, to let them to help them not to give up and to show the example to follow to be followed. Um, to continue fighting for a better life, to improve their life? Yeah, there's, um, I, I have depth, so personally, I've also went to the military hospital where um, U.S. veterans come back from like Iraq and Afghanistan, and they were, you know, in a dark place for a right reason, and I just kind of wanted to be like, you know, what I was able to do here was just, or hopefully, could do for them was show them that you know the other side of where they are so they're at this new start line basically it's like a race so it's like you know a start line but the finish line is so possible there's so many opportunities and um, you know if they want to do it um, they can do it they are very strong people they are very independent people and they are people and they're men and women who just don't give up and um, 
one thing that what the U.S. Paralympic Committee is trying to do more of is support the military. And so they're going to the hospitals as well and promoting, you know, sports and what type of sports are out there. So they're, and they're able to try something. They invite them if they're healthy enough or they bring it to the hospital and they're able to try, you know, wheelchair racing or a bike or something, or just anything you can think of. And that is so crucial for somebody who is so new because, you know, as a child, your mind is, is um, developed from our experiences, from the smells, from the hugs we receive, from the, yes, you can eat that cookie, no, you can't eat that cookie, and then you learn, you know, uh, all these things, and it's the same exact process. They're starting over in their new normal, and it's so healthy and so positive to see you can be, excuse my French, badass like you were, and an elite athlete, and continue to represent your country and represent, you know, your family and so many things. And on Thursday, Oksana had a meeting with in, in, in the hospital here in Kyiv for um, in the military hospital with um, some of the soldiers, young soldiers who came back from the war in eastern Ukraine, who um, were wounded, who lost their limbs, and uh, this was quite quite an encouraging, inspiring meeting for for, for, for for them. Correct? Um, I I don't know. I hope so. You know. Uh, I, I was so scared because, you know, it's very honoring that they would let me come in um, and see But you saw, you saw their faces. They, they were so um, inspired by your example. They were so amazed yeah. by what you could, have, you, could have, you could have achieved, what you achieved, actually. And uh, obviously, I think they do realize, and th this, this meeting with you uh, gave them um, an extra hope. Yeah, and I think the coolest thing was um, when they smiled. I really believe you could see the person personality who they are through their eyes and when they smile. And um, there were so many awesome people in that room. And those guys were A, good looking men, and B, are very, like, just have so much personality and life in them. And they're just waiting for an opportunity to start it. И я хочу рассказать маленькую историю. Вот мальчик, который подрался на мине. Потерял две ноги и руку. Три недели назад я принесла ему ваши фотографии. Он лежал такой свернувшийся, честно, мне сейчас просто слезы наворачиваются, когда я его видела, каким он был. А когда я показала ваши фотографии, он ожил, он мечтал, знаете, стать вот таким, как вы. И сейчас он видит вас в реальности. Вы стимулируете таких детей, таких людей. Благодарю. Очень благодарю вас. Don't ever give up at all, ever in life, and never give up on your dreams. And don't let anyone tell you what you can and what you cannot do, because you are the one that decides to do that and to you know. And um, if you want, I, I did bring some things. If you don't mind, they do say USA. I have something you can pick out. Who has the press? Who has the press? Oh, you took. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do it publicly so that everything, yeah. could, everyone could see it, and um, more people will want the presents. Yeah, but um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Thank you so much for coming here. Hello. During the visit to our military hospital, you mentioned every four years you have to have new uh, prosthetics. 
is it the whole uh, upper part or can you like scavenge from the old judging on the extreme high price of the pieces? Um, it all kind of varies on uh, where you are in, in your stage of the process of um, amputation and, and prosthetic wear and how active you are. I had a leg that uh, when I was younger, I didn't have like a fancy uh, microprocessing leg. I had a total knee and it's just on hinges and generic. That thing will last you forever. I, you know, it's waterproof. You can't damage it. Um, and it's somewhat easily to get, you know, screws and stuff replaced. The sockets kind of depend on when you're a brand new amputee, your body's changing, and it's going to be your body's going to be really big at first, and it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller, and you're going to develop more muscles to walk that you need. And that process, you know, you go through more just from here to here, uh, the socket of how you keep your leg on, and that usually is. Um, and you have liners too that is what you put on to keep that and so with the liners and the sockets it's probably like uh, I want to say between like three to five thousand dollars and um, but what a lot of people do too is they just can wear test sockets it's not the final product when they are in that stage because it's just plastic and it's you know, a couple hundred dollars to get it replaced. These knees, uh, the Genium specifically, they have a lifespan of four years, they say, and then within that four years, they will break. I mean, it's, it's a computer basically inside your leg, and the technology is, you know, just doesn't, it can't keep up with our bodies in our daily life, so, um, but you can set, it's, they're all under insurance when you own one of these. It's, the company insurance the legs and um, you can send it back and they will refurbish it. Like and not usually you can do that like two or three times and stuff. But at the same time like these are also six years old. So um, you know it just it's it varies so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was another question from this gentleman. Second row. Hi. Hi. Uh, so what are the most inspirational and motivation things that keep you moving on and not giving up in pursuing uh, your life goals and overcoming your problems or struggles? Um, you know, I have no idea. The things, I, f I feel like um, I like to live for things. So I love to, like my mom, gave me an opportunity to have start all over with my life. So I want to be able to enjoy every experience and do every experience because of her. I One of the things is, um, you know, I have friends that in the orphanages that weren't able to make it. And I, you know, I think about that every single day. I think about them every single day. And, um, you know, living for them and living for experiencing life for them and not being selfish and um, um, just, you know, I have no idea, honestly. I just don't want to have any regret in my life. At the end of the day, when I lay my head down, I like to just, you know, be happy with what I did that day and not regret anything um, and just live life with no regrets and no fear and it's so crazy because I used to be scared of when I look in the mirror and saw I had no legs in my hands I was not a happy person at first it took me a long time to um, accept everything but the minute I accepted everything that's where I think uh, all of a sudden my life changed and I got the hunger to live and realized, you know, this is who I am, but it's not about me. It's not about this. It's about life and it's about living each day to the fullest, not having one single regret. You are going to have bad days. Take another step forward, you know. 
Uh, my, one of my favorite expressions is, you know, you're going to fall down seven times, but you're going to get up eight. You're going to get up more than you fall. So, yeah. Thank you. I think this is very inspirational. Do we have any other questions from the audience? I think we have at least two. There is a gentleman here. Then. Yeah, there is. Uh, okay. So uh, I wanted uh, to talk, uh, maybe you know, an American actor, Christopher Reeve. He ah. has played uh, as uh, Superman, and in 1995, he fell from the horse and broke his neck. So oh, yeah. he, he became a quadriplegic. He was paralyzed down his neck. Oh, okay. uh, and uh, so his decision was uh, he used uh, his... Uh, his power, his connections, his popularity to become uh, the champion for the disabled. And uh, he, uh, he pushed uh, many programs that were designed for scientific research and uh, to make the life of disabled better. And uh, in this sense, I think uh, uh, from movie Superman, he kind of became the Superman in the real life. And uh, the moment when he fell from the horse was uh, kind of a defining moment in his life, I think, because uh, it has allowed him ultimately to make a big change in the world <coughs> than uh, he previously could. So do you consider yourself uh, this sort of person? I mean, uh, you have the, the popularity and uh, uh, maybe a bit similar position that uh, you could use maybe for Ukrainian disabled, for Ukrainian people to make this push. Basically, do you consider yourself a superwoman? <laughs> yeah. No, not a superwoman. Um, but I definitely want to consider myself and hopefully be that voice for who can't be that voice or for those who are afraid and um, not necessarily a voice, but just, um, I don't know, <laughs> um, and I, I, I want to be the person where, you know, you just can make people realize to, uh, life is not a guaranteed thing, and that, um, we've got, I, you gotta be so grateful for it, I, Well, it sounds like your visit is already bringing up awareness of, of, of the problem of handicapped people, yeah. of, 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 of for, for soldiers. Uh, you were at the military hospital yesterday. You had a meeting with uh, the president of Paralympic Committee here in Ukraine. Uh, you were discussing the problems. And um, th this your visit doesn't go unnoticed. Yeah, uh, thank you. That's amazing. Um, and I'm so thankful for those opportunities because, you know, I, like I said, I, I did struggle so much and I wouldn't accept my life and wouldn't accept the things that happened in my life for the longest time and lived it with anger and fear. But then, you know, once I accepted, you know what, this is my life and life is way too short to be angry and to be feeling robbed of things um, that, you know, <coughs> It's, it's bigger than who I am. I, you know, I am one little tiny dust in the sand. And together, everybody makes the whole world. It's not just one person. And um, I want to be that person where I can help maybe, you know, be an example for, for you. And, you know, then you, you see, and then you, it's able to go down generation to generation and to person to person, but then also to um, change the perception of society, too. And, you know, I am different. I pick the head, look, and turn back and stare. There are going to be, you know, people are like, oh my God. But you know what? Like, they're going to they're gonna see, um, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah, as, 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 as I said, um, you, you are doing a lot back, back yeah, in the U.S. and represent. also here. Yeah, life's about not you, it's about 
it's about everybody and um, I definitely want to represent you know uh, yeah for many people, you are already an inspiring example, and then just today we heard the, the story of this of this boy. Yeah. We just seeing your picture, God, 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 more hope. I see a lot of wisdom in your eyes, though, too, and a lot of strength. And I know that um, you know that, and that's what I see when I look at you. I see strength, and I see courage, and I see a lot of wisdom. And I don't. You know, I want to be, I want people to see that too when they look at anything that's different. It's not about, well, okay, she has purple pants on, he's got boot sneakers on. It's not about who we are and what is on the outside that counts. It's the things that are inside that make the difference, that change the world. And it's our minds that want to do that and our hearts. And, you know, um, I, I hope that. I'm just one person, but if I can help you, my life is complete. I am I, I'm happy because it starts with one person and it grows. And as a community, your voice together is gonna be the, the most powerful thing in the world together, but it will not be heard individually. have one um, time just for one last question I think we already have someone who wants to ask that question uh, thank you for sharing your story um, I think you're truly an inspirational person um, my question has to do uh, about the future as I understand this is your first time visiting Ukraine after uh, you left as a child um, and I was wondering if you had thought about how you could keep your connection to Ukraine um, and be closer to your birth country. Um, also, if you want to share any ideas and thoughts about the future, it would be interesting to hear that. Well, my, my thoughts on the future is I'm definitely coming back here. That definitely is in my future. Um, I love my experience here. And you know, Ukraine has never left me. It's never left my heart and my mind. I always knew where I came from. It's very important for me to remember where I came from. Um, and I am so lucky right now because I feel like I, I've been given an amazing opportunity and a gift in life to represent so many things, to represent two countries that I love dearly and are, are in me. And um, I have passion for my ho my homeland here, and I have I'm so happy and to call to have my home in America, and you know I want to be seeing the difference. I want to help what uh, what I have in America. I want to give it back to here because um, I know how it feels. I know how it feels to be. Without a mom, I know how it feels to be an orphan. I know how it feels to be a disabled orphan in an institution and an internaut. I know how it feels to look different than other people um, and to be to represent you know two different heritages and cultures and um, and and then also an athlete too and um, I. I, I want to try and help, um, you know, even if it's just person by person, I just want to try and help change the perception of, 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 or help enhance the perception, or I don't know what the right word is, um, but of how, of what is possible and that it's achievable. Regardless what you have or do not have, it's achievable here in Ukraine. Um, it doesn't start with money. It doesn't start with you know big fancy things. What it starts with is one person 
and it grows to everybody. You've got to believe in the change you want and you want to see it. And like I said, you know, if you just sit there and think about it, it's not going to happen. But you've got to express the interest and the importance of what you believe in. And, you know. And obviously you have to do something. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just about sitting there and thinking, gee, I wish this changes, or, you know, or gee, this is never going to change. This is what, you know, it's, it's always like this. And um, if it just starts by me being here and one person, you know, if it's that person that was scared to death to see somebody with prosthetics um, and then see me and they're like, oh my God, I have no idea that, that sh what, she's an athlete? What? You can still compete? What? She, wow, she's actually smart. Oh my gosh, she's actually, you know, has a heart. And, um, yeah, Oksana, I think you yeah. are already making a difference for a lot of people here in Ukraine who saw you on TV, on, on various media, who read about you, who, who, see, who saw you in person. You had, you had lots of meetings. And if you allow, I would like to ask a final question. Tell us about the blue and yellow scarf on your neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, today I had the opportunity to go to the head Paralympic um, committee here, like it's to the Ukrainian Paralympic committee here, and um, you know, in London, like I said, I love Ukraine. It's who I am. I am so happy to be from here. Um, when we were in London, I, I, I care if I got a medal, but when I saw Team Ukraine there, I wanted the little tiny pins that you get so bad. And I was like, oh my god, I'm fine if I just get this. And so I was followed the um, coach for Ukraine for a long time, and I was afraid to come up and ask for a pin. But um, he must have knew I was following him, because then he turned around and smiled and was like, hey, you know. Yeah. Um, and it meant so much. And so to, um, I was, uh, I was invited there and they presented me with um, this, um... So this is, this is a present for the Paralympic Committee of Ukraine, right? Yeah, and, and just, it's insane, I don't know what to say because it's insane to be a seven-year-old girl leaving this country, you know, not having a voice and able to come back to the same country where I came from and having such a huge voice, and then not only that, but being accepted in the Paralympic Committee for Ukraine as an athlete and um, as a person was just like, I have goosebumps because it's insane. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say. Well, I think we can only say that this is a truly incredible story and, and your visit is, is very inspiring for a lot of people. I'm sure that a lot of people uh, started looking differently at, 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 at the life in general at their own life uh, in particular and uh, we thank you for, for for finding the opportunity to come here we want to thank the America House and the United States Embassy for for bringing you all over yeah. here um, maybe we'll give a round of applause to everyone up our formal uh, part of, of this meeting uh, obviously a lot of you would like to have pictures with Oksana so go ahead take the pictures and I think we have informal time right yeah, and, yeah. okay and we Thank have the stuff we hand out too. all right yeah. so we have presence informal time and picture time with Oksana thank you everyone for coming